But let's go ahead and take a look at sensory physiology from here on out. And really, sensory physiology is really just an extension of nervous system physiology. So let's just take a look at some of the basic concepts for now, and then we're going to move on to the particular different types of sensory systems and talk more about them here in just a little bit. So really the goal of sensory systems is to turn other forms of energy and other forms of in information into action potentials. And so let's take a look at, at specific kinds here. And the first off one is mechanical reception, which is going to be the turning of some sort of mechanical energy or mechanical changes to the, to the environment into action potentials. We also have chemoreception that's going to be detecting some sort of chemical changes or uh, types to the environment. Thermoreception that's going to be detecting uh, temperature, particularly temperature changes. And also photoreception is another big one where we're going to be detecting light or changing light energy into action potentials. A couple others that occur in animals but we're not really going to talk a lot about because they don't really occur so much in humans is electroreception. So actually detecting electrical fields, and then uh, magnetoreception, which is detecting a magnetic field. And these are kind of related, but not really. And again, they don't really occur to any major extent in humans, so we're not really going to talk about those two. So let's let's classify the different kinds of sensory receptors that that occur in humans. And again, we can classify them by the types of sensation that they're given before, like the mechanoreceptors that we were just talking about, uh, thermoreceptors, photoreceptors, etc. Uh, but we can also classify them by the area of what they're sensing. So for instance, interoreception is the detection of the internal environment, or sensing something about the internal environment. We also have proprioception. Proprioception is going to be somehow detecting kind of the um, the placement of the body, so essentially detecting the how your body is situated in space. And we'll come back and talk to that, talk about that a little bit more in here in a bit. Um, if it's confusing right now, don't worry about that. We'll come back to it. And then exteros, um, exterior perception. Re, excuse me, exterior reception. Not a good day for me pronouncing things apparently. And this is going to be sensing the external environment somehow. So. For instance, there's two major groups of this, uh, somesthetic sensation. This is the types of sensation that are going to be essentially uniform or spread diffusely across the body. So for instance, thermoreception, the detection of temperature, you can feel it all over the place. Your hands, your head, your feet, kind of all over the place. Or touch. Touch is another thing that, that you're sensing all over your body. However, special sensation is senses that are localized in one specific area. For instance, sight. You don't see everywhere in your body. You're only seeing through two specialized organs in your head. Smell is another one, and hearing is another one. So these are the special senses. And then also we can talk about nociception. Nociception is the perception of pain. Now oftentimes a lot of the other types of sensation, for instance, photoreception, mechanoreception, uh, thermoreception, if they're intense enough, can be perceived as pain as well. However, we also have specific kinds of sensors that are going to be, when they're activated, specifically sensing or giving a signal of pain. So let's get back to the goal of what these sensory organs are really trying to do. And really they're trying to take these external stimuli and turn them into an action potential. So let's see kind of a generalized pathway of how that works from stimulus to action potential. Generally what's going to happen is you're going to get some sort of stimulus that's going to lead to a change in receptor membrane permeability. Now when I say receptor here, and when we say receptor throughout a lot of what's going on, and I need to cross that, just underline it. When we're talking about receptor in sensory physiology, we're not talking about a receptor necessarily in the molecular receptor sort of uh, sense, like you have an acetylcholine receptor on a cell, something like that. We're talking about receptor as in a type of cell that's going to be sensitive to the stimulus. So in this case, we're going to have some sort of stimulus is going to change the membrane permeability of some sort of cell that's sensitive to that stimulus that is a receptor. And then this change in membrane permeability is going to result in some sort of graded potential, often called a receptor potential, 
in that cell. And then this receptor potential at some point is going to be converted into action potentials. Uh, multiple single action potentials depending on what it is and what kind of stimulus you have. So we get from stimulus to action potential by going through this change in membrane permeability which causes a graded potential and then eventually turns into this action potential. And these stimuli when they get converted to action potentials can be coded in several ways because remember uh, stimuli are analog signals. They're going to be greater, lesser, you know, in some continuous uh, sort of magnitude. Whereas action potentials are all or nothing. They're on or off. So you need to encode the magnitude of these stimuli somewhere with these action potentials. And there's two different ways that can happen. First one is frequency coding, where a greater stimulus is going to cause a greater frequency of action potentials, so more of them per unit time. And we can also have population coding, where we get, with a greater stimulus, more receptors firing action potentials off and getting more action potentials actually in physical space, because more receptors are actually firing off rather than fewer. And then also it's going to be important to talk a little bit about what is this concept of receptive field. So receptive field is essentially the spatial area that any given receptor field or um, receptor cell is going to be sensitive to. So if you think about touch receptors in your skin, there is only going to be a certain area of your skin that any touch receptor is going to be able to uh, detect stimuli on. And that area is receptive field. So one consequence of this is that a smaller receptive field that you have, the greater the acuity is going to be of those receptors with that sense. Acuity being, um, greater acuity being the ability to detect, spatially uh, differentiate two different stimuli. At some point, if you get them spatially too close to each other, whether whatever sense you're talking about, you won't be able to discern them from a single stimulus. However, as we get smaller and smaller receptive fields in our senses, we can have greater and greater acuity. So, also another thing that we just want to kind of like talk about just slightly here is how does this get uh, some ideas about how this is transmitted to the or transmitted to the central nervous system. And one important concept here is this idea of labeled lines. Now, label lines means that for each sensor, sensory receptor, this is going to pass information back up to the CNS through a discrete set of neurons. And what that means is, again, if you take, imagine some um, sensory receptor, like a touch receptor in your pointer finger, for instance, and if you touch it, that information about that stimulus is being passed to your brain through a discrete set of neurons, that's the same every time. It's going to be going through this set of neurons and passed from an afferent neuron in your finger to some sort of interneuron in the uh, spinal cord, which is then going to pass this up to a specific touch center in your brain where the information is going to be processed and decisions made about. It. So all these senses are going to be passed in these discrete sets of neurons and all of these different senses are going to be kept separate. So all this information is kept separate as it's passed through the peripheral nervous system and then also to the CNS. So in the central nervous system, you have, especially in your cerebral cortex, specific areas of the brain that are set aside specifically to process certain types of sensory information. For instance, you have a visual region of your cerebral cortex that is going to just be processing visual information. Same with touch, same with thermal reception, on down the line. And so this is the concept of these labeled lines. Uh, lines, we're talking lines as in like a telephone line type thing here, that are set aside specifically for some given type of uh, sensory reception. And if we didn't have that, it would be very difficult to keep all of your different senses straight. It'd be very easy to mix up the information and, for instance, um, see color or smell colors or something like that and that's not what happens generally now there are some people that uh, have synesthesia that do have that but that's a different uh, different thing going on there entirely 
Another thing that happens in reception is this thing called adaptation. And some, some receptors, when they're receiving a constant stimuli, may adjust the output that they're receive or that they're putting out based on that stimulus. And so we lump receptors basically into two different groups. We have what are known as tonic receptors. Tonic receptors are going to tend to stay the same or vary just a little bit. Whereas basic receptors will tend to uh, adapt very quickly. So what do we mean by adapt? So if you, you are, for instance, being touched by something, very quickly those touch receptors that you're being touched by will not be passing touch information to your brain anymore. They'll adapt. They'll uh, decrease the signal that they're sending and eventually not send anymore at all. And this is really the point of this is to free up the brain from unneeded stimuli. So for instance, you really don't need to feel the shirt that you're wearing all the time. It doesn't make any sense for you to feel the shirt all the time. And so in order to decrease them, that amount of information that's going to be sent back up to your brain, we might as well just shut off those receptors. Hey, we know the shirt's there. Let's just not pass that information anymore. And so basic receptors are going to adapt very quickly and start shutting off. Well, there's two different ways that this adaptation may be happening. This could be either intrinsic, and this means that there's going to be some sort of mechanism in the receptor itself that is going to tend to shut off the signal after an amount of time. Or it could be extrinsic, where there is some processing or filtering in the CNS that is going to turn down the that information, or at least the processing of that information as time goes by. So these are the two types of uh, adaptation. The other thing that's really important about um, signaling and signaling of sensory information is that we're going to get some filtering, some innate filtering that's happening of these signals as they're being uh, collected. And one really big and important type of signal filtering that's going to be happening is called lateral inhibition. Lateral, lateral inhibition is essentially um, the ability of a single receptor when it's getting a large enough, sufficient enough stimulus and it's turned on is going to inhibit the surrounding neurons or the surrounding receptors to keep them from turning on. And this is sometimes called on-center, off-surround type filtering. And what it's going to do is in enhance contrast. And so there's always going to be some small amount of spillover between receptive fields of a given stimulus. If you poke yourself uh, with a pencil on your finger, not only the area that you are poking is going to be depressed, but also some of the skin around is going to be depressed as well. And to be able to very accurately localize where that pencil is poking with, the receptors immediately under that pencil are going to turn off the touch receptors immediately around that and prevent them from also sending signals so that you can very precisely tell where that poke is coming from. So this is, again, enhancing contrast. Let's uh, look really uh, uh, quickly at how this will tend to happen. What we have here is uh, some sort of neuron, an uh, afferent neuron. What we have up here is whatever receptor is there, so some sort of uh, stimulus receptor. And then here off to the side we have the cell body, so like many afferent neurons, we have a pseudo-unipolar neuron. And then down here we have axon terminals. And these can then synapse onto something. So what we're actually seeing here is one, two, three different axon terminals. Okay, so this this uh, receptor, whatever it is, is not going to be sitting alone. It's actually be sitting in some population here. And so you'll see each of them kind of, uh, uh, you have some sensory area up here at the top, something that, um, some interface with the environment and then going back towards the CNS this way. Well, if you look on many of these sort of 
uh, sensory arrays of apparent neurons, what you'll see is there's actually interneurons that are placed in between these neurons such that one apparent neuron is going to synapse onto an interneuron that will then presynaptically interface with or synapse presynaptically with the afferent or the uh, main axon terminal of an adjoining afferent neuron. What that means is if we get some large signal coming down through this middle afferent neuron, what that is going to do is it's going to tend to turn off these two adjoining um, afferent receptors. And that is going to increase our ability to resolve exactly where this stimulus is coming from. Now, this only works as long as this signal that's coming from this middle one is stronger than the ones coming from the sides. As long as we have greater than or equal to, equal to or greater than number of action potentials coming down this way. If they're fewer, then this inhibition is not going to be sufficient and some of that is going to be coming through. And if one of these side ones starts to have a greater stimulus and their action potentials, the number, the frequency of those action potentials increase more than the center one, then it, those will start to tend to decrease the um, or inhibit the action potential by that one from going on to the CNS. So this is lateral inhibition. It's going to be really important as we go on both in touch and mechanoreception sometimes, but then also in photoreception and some other ones. So okay, that's kind of a general overview of what's happening in uh, sensory physiology. Let's go on now to specific individual types of senses, for instance, mechanoreception. So let's get into talking about specific senses, and we're going to start out with mechanoreception. And mechanoreception really is just the sensing of any sort of mechanical pressure or distortion. And so this is going to be used all over the place for a lot of different things, and it, it covers what you would probably think of as being a lot of different senses. So for instance, this includes uh, the sense of touch, which is uh, some, uh, some aesthetic sense, so it's distributed all over your body. But we're also talking about some very special senses as well, such as hearing. So you normally don't think of hearing essentially being an extension of your sense of touch, but it is really in, in, in certain ways. And also proprioception, which we're not going to talk a lot about right now, but we'll come back to a lot more when we're talking about muscles again is another sense that is lumped in here into a can of reception. So let's begin out here by just talking a little bit about touch. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with touch because honestly the, the physiology here is relatively, relatively simple and not going to get too much into it. So first off, one of the, one of the sense organ or the sense receptors that we have here are the Pacinian corpuscles. Pacinian corpuscles, these are actually going to be touch receptors that are fairly deep in the dermis. So very light touch just on the, the surface of the skin are not going to be detected by uh, Pacinian corpuscles. But if you if you grab your hand or something like that fairly strongly, that, that kind of deep sense of, of touch that you're getting there, that's more Pacinian corpuscles. Also, a lot of the other like kind of soft sense of touch that you have throughout your body is going to be taken care of by just simple sensory dendrites. So essentially just dendrites of neurons that have some sort of special channels, ion channels on them, that are going to react somehow to, excuse me, mechanical distortion. So oftentimes these ion channels are going to have these long protein fibers that are attached to them, that as these protein fibers are disturbed, they are going to pull open these ion channels causing a graded potential and thus causing the sensation by uh, pathways that we've talked about already. So oftentimes these long protein fibers, they give it a larger kind of receptive area for these ion channels, but they can also act as levers. They're going to amplify small amounts of signal. We have a lot of these sort of sensory dendrites around the base of our hairs. So your hair is often very sensitive to touch. You can touch the end of a hair. Like for instance, you can, if you have any hair on your arm, you can touch just 
lightly the ends of hairs on your arm, and you can feel that. Because we have these mechanoreceptors that are wrapped around the bases of our, of our hairs. Also, just kind of in the surface of your skin, you have a lot of large area dendrites, so dendrites that have a large area near the skin surface that also have these um, mechanically sensitive ion channels that also give you a lot of the sensation of touch in the surface of your skin. And so that's, that's really all we're going to talk specifically about touch, but let's go on and start talking about some very specific mechanoreceptors. So what you're looking here at here is a hair cell. Not a hair cell in the terms of hair like you have on your, your body, but a specific kind of mechanoreceptor cell that is going to detect some sort of movement or some sort of motion. And so in these hair cells, we generally have a cell body, and then we have some sort of cilia that are extending from one end of this. And there's two different kinds of cilia here. There is the longest one, which is known as the kinocilium. And then we also have these other ones here that are shorter, which are known as stereocilia. Stereocilia. Now these stereocilia will often have some sort of ion channel at the top in the top portions of these stereocilia and they're going to be connected to adjacent stereocilia or the kinocilium by this this protein link that is called a tip link now these tip links are going to be attached to this ion channel and attached to these other stereocilia so if the adjoining stereocilia move in relationship to these, it can open up these ion channels and begin a graded potential, allowing ions to enter the cell and go through that whole process that we've been talking about. Now, they're called stereocilia. Stereo, you probably know to mean that you have differential inputs from two sides of something, and that's what we have here. We're going to have some sort of differential input. When the cilia are standing neutral, as they are now, there's enough tightness, there's enough tension on these tip links to hold the um, these ion channels open to a small degree. And so what we'd have on the back end of this hair cells would actually have some sort of synapse from another neuron, and then we'd be getting some sort of neurotransmitter release, neurotransmitter in this vesicle, release onto the synapse and some sort of signal being conducted. And when they're neutral, so when we're neutral, we get low amounts of neurotransmitter release. Re I don't know how to the whole one doing this. Release. So we get this low amounts of neurotransmitter release when it's standing neutral. So we get some small tonal activity. Well, let's, let's look at what would happen if we bend them one particular way. So if we bend them towards the kinocilium, what's going to happen is these tip links are going to pull more strongly. That's going to open greater numbers or these ion channels to a greater degree. And so in one direction, we will have, here's our synapse or our uh, other neuron here synapsing to this. And then um, one way, so towards the kinocilium, towards the kinocilium, we get increased neurotransmitter release. And so these, these hair cells have very specific signals that they're going to send out, greater neurotransmitter release, if they are being pushed in one particular direction. Well, let's look at what happens if they get pushed away from the kinocilium. And what we have here is a slackening of these um, tip links here. And so if we get them moving away from the kinocilium, 
what we have is we have a no neurotransmitter release. And so what we have here is these hair cells now, we have some mechanism in which not only can we tell if they're being disturbed, but we have a mechanism by which we can tell, or we have differentiating signals, differentiating signals about which way they're being disturbed. So if they are being pushed one direction, we get no a decrease in neurotransmitter release or no neurotransmitter release. And if we go the other direction, we get an increase in neurotransmitter release. And if they're just staying neutral, we have some low tonic level of neurotransmitter release. So the neurons behind this that are getting the signal from this sensory receptor are going to have an idea or, uh, I mean, a differential signal depending on which way these are being bent. Kind of take a look. There's some really interesting photomicrographs of this. So this is a... Um, the above kind of the unembedded area of a hair cell what you're seeing here this is actually in the inner ear of a frog which is kind of interesting but what you can tell there is one kind of cilium up here the right up there that's the kind of cilium and then we have all of these stereo cilium all over down here if you look really closely like right there you can actually see the tip links between the stereo cilia and the adjacent stereo cilia so if we tend to push this this way, away from where we're looking at it, we tend to get an increase in neurotransmitter release. And if something were to push it back this way, so push it back towards us, the viewers, we would tend to get this decrease in neurotransmitter release. So uh, kind of really neat and novel way of being able to detect specific kinds of movement, not just, not just some sort of mechanical distortion in general, but also be able to tell something about that stimulus, as in the direction of that st stimulus. So hair cells actually get used all the time in a lot of different ways in a lot of different organisms. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those. So let's talk, or one more figure here, actually. Here's an even closer uh, micrograph here. we got some stereo cilia here, and you can actually see the tip links to the adjoining stereo cilia. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, so let's talk about one specific kind of deployment, essentially, of the stereocilia. And this is in an organ called an ampulla. In these ampulla, what we have is we have some protuberance, some swelling area, that is going to have a lot of hair cells, then, that are embedded in the surface of that swelling. Now, there's going to be a lot of other cells through here that I'm not, not showing. These, there is other sorts of supporting cells all the way through here. Just not showing them. It's not just kind of this connective matrix. It's actually other cells in here. And then what we have on the top of this is this area called the cupula. This cupula, this blue area surrounding the top, is actually this gelatinous material that is going to extend up somewhat into the media and this is going to tend to move and so as this cupula moves this way is going to move these hair cells and as this cupula moves this way it's going to move the hair cells back that way and this cupula specifically is going to be essentially an amplifier for whatever is happening up here so even very small movements at the top of the cupula will be able to move these hair cells and we're getting increased sensitivity by putting these hair cells into some organ like this it's into um, into this ampulla with this cupula top this cupula cap on this and and this increases our sensitivity of that and then of course one thing i should add we're going to have all of these neurons that are coming back from here that are synapsing onto the back of these and forming some sort of nerve that's coming from this that's providing the signal back towards the brain. And so, and these are axons coming together. It's not necessarily all synapsing onto one neuron. This is probably multiple neurons and all their axons coming together to form some specific nerve. And so that's kind of the organization that we would have. We'd have this sensory organ up here, this ampulla, nerves on the synapsing onto the back of our hair cells here that would receive the uh, information from them transit transmit that back to the brain
Well, let's look at specifically, where do we have these in our own body? So let's start talking about the inner ear. And the inner ear really is going to have a lot of different specific organs that are going to be especially very, very sensitive and very specialized mechanoreceptors. Essentially, very specialized touch sensation. The one we're going to talk about right now is this area right here, the vestibular apparatus. And these loops right through here are the semicircular canals. Now these semicircular canals are hollow canals that are filled with endolymph. That is this liquid that is going to move around in these canals. And you have three different canals that are essentially in the three different dimensions of, of space. You have one essentially in a flat x-plane, and a flat y-plane, and a flat z-plane. They're all at 90 degrees to each other, so that you can get heat or this endolymph movement in whatever direction you will tend to move your head. And so as you move, as your head moves, you will get a flow of endolymph around these semicircular canals. And depending on which way that motion is, and in what planes that motion is, you're going to get relatively more or less movement in these different semicircular canals. So let's take a look specifically at these. So we have these semicircular canals kind of, uh, flowing through this area right here. And towards the base of these semicircular canals, you'll notice this enlargement right here. Well, this enlargement right here is this area called the ampulla. Or, yeah, it is the ampulla. And in the ampulla, you notice that we have these hair cells down here. This is specifically where we're going to get the um, diffraction, or essentially the movement, or sensing the movement of this endolymph through here. This is going to uh, push around this cupula right here, the cupula of this, and that is going to send signal back towards the brain through this nerve, which is the vestibular nerve. So through the vestibular nerve, now we're going to get some idea about this. But there's, a, there's, there's one kind of little problem with this, in that you only get information from these similar, semicircular canals while your head is in motion. And so because you need the endolymph to be moving to really set off these hair cells and, and do a signal, send a signal down the nerve to the brain, how in the world do you have any sort of signal or how do you know which kind of which orientation you're at and that turns out this comes from these two organs right here this which is the urticum and right here which is the saccula now the urticum and the saccula are going to give you information about the position of your head while it's not moving while it's in in one uh, place. So let's see, how in the world does that work? Well, you in the urticle and the saccula, you have these membranes that have hair cells in them as well. And over that, we have this layer of gelatinous material. And in the top of this gelatinous material, we have these calcareous little granules called otoliths. These otoliths are greater density than this gelatinous material that in which these uh, cilia are embedded. So as it gets moved off of perfectly straight up and down, you're going to get some movement caused by gravity pulling on these otoliths to deform or pull this gelatinous material one way or another. And that is going to then deform or pull the cilia, the stereocilia of these hair cells and then, just like in your ampulla, you're going to get signal that is then sent back to the brain from this. And so this way, this type of mechanism is not going to change if you stop moving. If you stop moving, it's going to continue to send signal about the position of your head. It doesn't need to be in position or moving right at that moment. So really, these are the, uh, the vestibular senses right here. This is how you are getting information about which way your head is moving and which way that it's orientated. So this, along with proprioception, is going to give you a really good, a lot of the, the inputs that you need to kind of move around, 
stay in balance, you know, know where your body is in space and how it's moving in space. But there's more to the inner ear than that. There's, I mean, as you, I'm sure you probably know, you can hear with your ears as well. So let's talk a little bit about that because that's mechanoreception as well. And so let's talk about what's going on there. Well, we have your ear canal here, which is the meatus, the, the, uh, the canal right here. And you have your eardrum, which is also known as the tympanic membrane. Now, as sound of some sort enters the ear, it's going to cause this tympanic membrane to vibrate. Now, in order to vibrate, the pressure on the outside of the tympanic membrane and the pressure on the inside of the tympanic membrane have to be approximately equal. If there was greater pressure on one side or the other, it would hold this tympanic membrane tight and it could not vibrate. So how in the world do we do that? Because your external pressure of the external world is changing all the time, actually. Just day to day, you get pretty good changes in air pressure. So how in the world do we maintain that? You actually have this tube right here that goes to the pharynx, actually goes into the back of your throat, and um, equalizes the pressure in your inner ear with that of the external environment. And this is called your eustachian tube. Now, divers are probably very familiar with their eustachian tubes because this is both the blessing and the bane of scuba divers. Uh, if you didn't have a eustachian tube, you couldn't scuba dive at all. However, if you have any sort of congestion, these eustachian tubes can get somewhat plugged up and not equalize uh, air pressure very well. And so as you start to dive and the pressures increase, they'll put increasing, increasing pressure on your tympanic membrane. That can actually be quite painful. And if it gets to be too bad, you can actually rupture your eardrum, your tympanic membrane, and that's not fun at all. So eustachian tubes, quite familiar to probably some of you listening to this. So once you're vibrating this tympanic membrane, that sound is actually going to be transmitted by these ossicles. These three bones are going to transmit it to the cochlea here, which is this snail-shaped object back here. And so these three ossicles are called the malleus, which also means hammer, the incus, and this uh, kind of um, loop-shaped one is the stapes. And the stapes is right up against this opening in the cochlea called the oval window. Down on the other end of the cochlea, we have this other opening, which is called the round window. Very creative, whoever came up with this. And by the vibration of this, the stapes against the oval window, this is going to transmit those vibrations into the cochlea. So let's look a little bit more at what's happening inside there. So we have the stapes here that is vibrating somewhat, transferring those vibrations into the cochlea. We have these two different um, channels here. We have this upper one, which is called the scala vestibuli. And then we also have this lower channel that's actually connected here at the end. So vibrations that come in through the scala vestibuli can get back out, after they go around the loop here, back out to the scala tympani. T-Y-M-P-A-N-I, tympani. And so these vibrations are going to travel down the scala vestibuli all around and then back out through the scala tympani, vibrating all the way and vibrating this inner chamber as well. So you have this chamber that's running between them, which is known as the scala media. And it's actually in this scala media where hearing is actually going to take place. This is where we're going to get transduction, finally, of these uh, sound waves into some sort of action potential there. So let's take a look at this here. Again, we have sound that's going to hit the tympanic membrane. 
these ossicles are going to impact, they're connected to the tympanic membrane, then going to impact the oval window on the cochlea. And one point I want to get in here is that going through these ossicles, the oval window is actually going to be vibrating with 20 times greater force than the tympanic membrane. There's a couple different reasons for this. Number one, the tympanic membrane is much bigger than the oval window. So the force that the tympanic membrane is moving with gets amplified just by the sheer greater size of it than the small tympan or the small oval window. Also, the ossicles, the way they're arranged, also act as levers as well. They give you a mechanical advantage have if you're trying to use like a screwdriver to open a box top or something like this. It's going to give you a mechanical advantage that's also going to amplify that force as well. Then this vibrating oval window is going to vibrate the fluid in the cochlea, specifically in the, the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani, and then inside the, uh, excuse me, inside the scala media. So let's take a very a closer look at what's going on here. So we just described what's what's happening through here. We have uh, these auditory or cochlear nerves leaving all the way through here. But let's look at a cross section of what's going in the cochlea. So this is a cross section. Again, we have the scala vestibuli up here, scala tympani down here, and here's the scala media right in here. And what we have here is this red membrane through here is the basilar membrane. This basilar membrane is actually going to vibrate as the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani begin to vibrate uh, with the sound waves that are moving through here or these, these pressure waves that are moving through here. This basilar membrane is going to vibrate up and down. On top of this basilar membrane is this organ of cordae. The organ of cordae has a lot of hair cells in it. It has an inner row of hair cells, and these hair cells, this inner row, or excuse me, do I have that right? Let me double check that. We have these, but either way, we have these two rows of hair cells, and these two rows of hair cells, yes, this is the inner one. Excuse me. These two rows of hair cells are going to to be vibrating as well inside the organ of corda as this basilar membrane vibrates, because they're also located, or they're also kind of the tips of these cilia are embedded in this tectoral membrane above. And so, as this apparatus down here vibrates, is vibrating these hair cells, and this one, this inner row. of hair cells, which only has one in the row, is actually what is transducing the the waves into action potentials or grid potentials that are then out here through the auditory nerve. Auditory nerve. So that that's where this is going to leave. Now, so why in the world do we have this these three outer rows of hair cells? Well, it turns out these three outer rows of hair cells, when this begins vibrating, they will actually elongate their cilia. And it's this causes greater vibration of the basilar membrane of the organ of cordae. So what happens is as you as they push very like at the very beginning they just give this one push that increases its vibration and it's kind of like have you ever as you're jumping or someone is jumping on the words lost on me here trampoline there we go if someone's drum, jumping on a trampoline have you ever gone up there and give a good push to the trampoline at just the right time, and it actually makes the person bounce like twice as high as they bounced before. This is what's happening here. It gives a push at the right time that increases that oscillation and is going to then act as more amplification for this inner row of hair cells so they can actually detect smaller and smaller sounds as well. So that's actually how this is being transduced. 
sound waves being transmitted into vibrations in the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani as it goes around here. They're going to vibrate the basilar membrane, which on top of which is uh, sitting the organ of cordae, which has these hair cells in them that have their tips embedded in the tectorial membrane. Because this organ of cordae and basilar membrane is vibrating, it's going to cause mechanical deformations in the cilia of these hair cells, and that is going to cause uh, an action potential eventually to be generated from that down the auditory nerve. So that's really how we get from sound, these pressure waves in the air, to actual action potentials. So one more thing that I want to just talk about here is how, well then, how in the world do we hear different tones, different pitches of sound? So what you're having here is, this is kind of like the cochlea if we were to unwind it and just make it straight. Over here we have the stabies. We have the oval window right next to it. We have the round window down here. And what we have down here is we have the tectoral membrane. Okay, that's not tectoral membrane right there. Down here what we have is the black here is the um, basilar membrane. And then up above it here, we have the organ of corti. And then these lines here are all these hair cells all the way along. One thing I want you to notice is this uh, basilar membrane goes from very thin, and it gradually gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And it's actually very thin and very firm back towards the beginning of the cochlea, and gets very, very large and actually loose towards the end. What happens is different wavelengths will tend to vibrate different parts of the basal membrane more. So if we had a very short wavelength, uh, comes in here and the stapes is vibrating very shortly, so we have a very short wavelength like this, it's going to tend to vibrate here. Or if we had a very long wavelength like this, it's going to tend to vibrate the basilar membrane towards the end. So this is going from somewhere around uh, 20 hertz down here, so 20 oscillations per second all the way down there at the end to about 20,000 hertz down here for 20 kilohertz at that end. And so that's what we have happening. That's why we can detect different pitches of tone is that it's depending on where is it maximally vibrating, this basilar membrane. And that's how we get different tones. So that is kind of a very extreme specialization of mechanoreception, of essentially this, this sense of touch. And that's, that's really, by all these amplification methods, we, we've made this sense of touch very, very sensitive so that if you have, if you hear something drop at the other end of Rigby Hall, down, you, you think about the main end of Rigby Hall, from the main office all the way down to Dr. McKinsey's office. So we have a very long hall there. If you drop a, like a pencil at one end of that, you can hear it at the other end. Those are incredibly small pressure waves that you are able to feel, essentially, and, and, and make some very fine discriminations about the nature of those pressure waves, i.e. Their, their frequency, essentially through this sense of touch in which we have this elaborate mechanisms for amplifying those vibrations and transmitting them into these stereo cilia and these hair cells that then produce action potentials. So let's move on now to another form of special sensation, particularly photoreception, which is pretty interesting.